right then, let's set our motivation. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from desire for friends and hatred for enemies. And just letting your mind connect with those four. Love, compassion, joy, equanimity. And then refuge in bodhicitta. Sange chudan soge chunam nai janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi chun yangi pe sonam gi drola penchi sange drupa sho sange chudan soge chunam la janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi chun yangi pe sonam gi Roll up in Jesange Drupa Show Sange Chudon Sogi Chunamna Janju Badu Dani Kapsuchi Dagi Chun Yangi Pe Sonamgi Roll up in Jesange Drupa Show Letting that connect. Okay, so this particular text, I think most of you know, is one of my heart texts, heart practices. It's one of my favorite practices of all time. Um, and when we do a practice like this, I think it's so important to remember these are bold statements of aspiration. We shouldn't expect ourselves to be living up to these as soon as we read them, as soon as we understand them intellectually. We shouldn't put pressure on ourselves to perform being a bodhisattva or being a Buddha. We don't want to create a facade. We don't want to create some sort of, I don't know, inauthenticity. We don't want to, we don't want to block what's real. We want to be really starting where we are. And it's tricky when we're approaching a text like this because these are beautiful ideals many of which you already had in your heart before you read a text like this, or you've read a text like this hundreds of times for decades, and then you read it and you think, I still don't live up to this. So make sure that when, when we do this course, when we do this text, that you hear it with the ears of inspiration, of being uplifted and elevated, not from the perspective of pressure. Yeah. Because really, if we could do all of these things already, we'd be Buddhas. So um, with that perspective, I thought I would just give the classic contextualization so we're all on the same page, and then we'll be off to the races. We've got Chen Rezig, Avlokiteshvara, Buddha of Compassion there, not a coincidence. So although the purpose of all the Buddha's teachings is to train the mind, there arose in Tibet a special set of teachings called mind training or thought transformation. In Tibetan, it's called lojong. And lojong is a genre of teaching, and this particular text falls in that genre. So it was developed by the Kadamba Geshis, disciples of Atisha and Dom Trompa, beginning around the 12th century. But it actually has its textual roots in Nagarjuna's Precious Garland and Shanti Deva's engaging in the Bodhisattva's deeds, as well as in various sutras, right? So it's not like Tibetans made this. It's not a Tibetan creation. This is coming from the Buddha. It's coming from the Nalanda tradition of Indian scholars, but it really got popularized by the Tibetans, particularly around the 12th century. So it was taken up by all the Buddhist traditions, um, Sakya, Nyingma, Kagyu, Geluk, Rime, all the Tibetan traditions love mind training, and all of these texts center on the development of the two bodhicittas. Conventional bodhicitta, which is the altruistic intention, 
an ultimate bodhicitta, the wisdom realizing emptiness, informed by that altruistic intention, right? So the point of all of them is the development of these two bodhicittas. So they especially emphasize cultivating bodhicitta by means of equalizing and exchanging self and others. And most are written in pithy, straightforward style that aims directly at the self-centered attitude and self-grasping, the two principal enemies of bodhisattvas. Okay, so we have to do this contextualization so that we know where we're starting from. So the author of this text, Chekawa, who says to possess all the marks of a great being right from birth. He became fully ordained at the age of 23 and was given the ordination name Yeshi Dorje. It's said that even after Chekawa had memorized more than 100 scriptures, he had the uneasy feeling that there was some other teaching essential for the achievement of enlightenment that he had not yet received. So when he was 30, he met the great master Sharawa, who gave him experiential teachings for 12 years. This included the practice of exchanging oneself with others, which he passed on to Chekawa as a secret teaching. It is at the heart of this text, which focuses on how to eliminate self-grasping and the self-cherishing attitude that are the source of all suffering and problems we face in life. So Geshe Chakawa achieved a profound sense of satisfaction as the result of the instructions he received from Sharawa. He expressed this at the end of the seven points for training the mind when he says, now I have no regrets, even if I die. So um, I received this teaching many, many times, mainly at Chen Rizig Institute um, through the precise scholarly trainings and lived example of Kenzo Rinpoche Geshitashi Sering and the experiential teachings of people like Jetsuma Tenzin Pomo. So there's me. <laughs> you can see me in the, in the Sea of Maroon or the Sea of Saffron. Um, and during this time, we mainly used mind training like the rays of the sun by Nam Kapel which explains the seven point mind training in terms of the Lam Rim structure that a lot of you are familiar with. So then I taught it to you guys more than 10 years ago. Remember? <laughs> Remember? How many of you were there? I'm just curious. I think maybe half of you were there. Yeah, it was ages ago, but it was the very first thing I taught when I came to New South Wales. And I think that part of the reason I keep returning to this teaching again and again and again is that it makes me laugh at myself. Yeah, and I feel like growth is so much easier with humor and growth is so much easier if the teachings help you feel connected to the human experience, not like an alien that needs to be fixed. So this teaching, it really, it's humorous, it's provocative, it's pointed, and they're the sort of things that, as Venerable Pema Chodron would call them, they're like slogans, which sounds kind of cheesy in American, but slogans is an interesting way of framing it because they're like short little sentences that will just spring into your mind. So you're having a relationship difficulty or you're having a workplace drama. These will just enter into your mind once they're familiar and cut off the tendency for negative states of mind before they get ahead of steam. So the more you read them, the more likely it is for them to just jump off the page at you and really get into your bones. Okay. So it starts, homage to great compassion. Homage to great compassion. What is great compassion as opposed to regular compassion? You know, when you hear great compassion, what do you think the author means by that? Are they just using, I don't know, hyperbole? Or are they just trying to get you excited? Is it just sort of Dharma advertising? Why is it great compassion? It's important to sit with, right? What makes it great? It's the same great Jumpa um, Chempo, Jumpa Chempo, as you find in the Sevenfold Cause and Effect, 
um, if you remember the sevenfold cause and effect, recognizing all sentient beings as having been your mother, etc., gets to love, compassion, then great compassion, which becomes the substantial cause for bodhicitta. So the substantial cause for bodhicitta is great compassion. So what differentiates compassion from great compassion? Sometimes it's equated with the highest intention. And it's the idea that you not only see the suffering of sentient beings and want to free sentient beings from suffering, but you're taking personal responsibility to do so. So it's that addition of deciding, I will facilitate this. I'm taking this on board myself. The welfare of all sentient beings is my job. And that's beautiful. And then you sit with it and think, but how though? <laughs> but what if, but I can't do that. And anyway, some sentient beings don't want to be helped or they're beyond help or, you know, you have natural doubts arise. So we remember that this is a mental attitude that decides the whole reason I practice the spiritual path is so that I can help other people practice the spiritual path. Why do we practice a spiritual path? To alleviate suffering, to stop harming ourselves and others, and also to develop, to develop our wisdom such that it's omniscient, what hubris, right? To develop our minds so that they're perfection, perfect, stable, lasting happiness. Really? <laughs> Possible? Right? So having great compassion, it's a big ask. Because you're really saying, not only do I wish all sentient beings freedom from suffering, I am going to facilitate that. I'm going to help bring that about. Then you sit with, what is the best way to do that? What is the best way to actually help anyone with anything, let alone spiritual development? How can I, how can I help anyone with anything? Well, who am I? Where am I on the path? Yeah. We can really only help people to the degree to which, yes, they are receptive, but also where does our skill set meet them? Yeah, where, how much are we able to see where their receptor sites are to be helped? So you can't help someone more than they're open to or more than they have the karma for, but you need to know how open they are and what they have the karma for. So you need to be a Buddha. You need to be a Buddha in order to offer the best care and the best facilitation strategies to help sentient beings enlighten themselves. So you're not fixing anyone, you're not changing anyone, you're not saving anyone. You're creating the best conditions for them to heal themselves, just as the Buddhas that already exist are trying to give us the best conditions for us to heal ourselves. But it is really true when they say the Dharma is like medicine, because it only works if you take it. It only works if you take it. So we can become like the doctor, like the Buddha, who can diagnose, who can prescribe. And we want to be as accurate in our diagnosis and our prescriptions as possible. But it's still up to the suffering sentient being whether or not they take the medicine. Yeah. So it's it's the way of understanding your spiritual practice where you feel enlivened, you feel emboldened, you feel momentum, you feel enthusiasm, but it's not pressure. Because so much is still out of your hands. Even when you're a Buddha, so much is still out of your hands. So it's like doing your best and letting go becomes the way to live as an ordinary person, a bodhisattva, an Arya bodhisattva, and a Buddha. It's the same strategy. Do your best, let go. Do your best, let go. And your doing best just gets a better and better best. And you want it to be, but it's the same basic idea. How is that sitting so far? Great compassion is compassion with a sense of responsibility. And it's the substantial cause for bodhicitta. Does that make sense? Sit well? You got any qualms? It's something interesting to sit with, right? Because, you know, it's it's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking 
I should then make everyone listen to the things I'm listening to or find the advice that I've found to be useful. And everyone is so different, you know, and we really need to respect everyone's path. And the best way to do that is to really understand ourselves. We become the experiment for what enables transformation without assuming that the same thing is true for everyone. So the author starts, homage to great compassion. It's, it's really interesting. It's not homage to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. It's not homage to my glorious guru. It's homage to great compassion. And I think there's something very beautiful about it being to the concept itself. Even though, of course, we know that concept itself is embodied in any number of holy beings. So that's where we're starting from with this text. And then the essence of this nectar of secret instruction is transmitted from the master from Sumatra, meaning Atisha. So Atisha, who is quite famous for having composed the lamp on the path to enlightenment, one of our first Lomrim texts. So he's saying this is where his lineage came from, just as before I was explaining where mine came from. This is an important way to understand the unbroken oral tradition from the time of the Buddha. So then here's the heading, revealing the features of the doctrine to engender respect for the instruction. So you should understand the significance of this instruction as like a diamond, the sun, and a medicinal tree. At this time of five degenerations will then be transformed into the path to the fully awakened state. So the part I wanted to pull out was this time of five degenerations. This time of five degenerations. So what Geshe Chakawa is describing is what we see now. What we see now with environmental collapse, what we see now with the collapse of societal ethics, what we see now with the collapse of like the vitality of food and medicines, you know, all sorts of different collapses are happening. Things that were supposed to support life aren't doing it as well as they used to. Yeah, we kind of are seeing this and people seem to be getting more degenerate. Yeah, not everyone, but the percentages seem to be tipping. Um, there feels like there's a real tension in the world. There's a lot of worries about, you know, is it going to end in fire? Is it going to end in flood? Are we going to be taken over by aliens? Are we all going to die at 50? Or like, what's going to happen to us? You know, and, and you're sitting with, what is wrong? What happened? And it's really a normal thing to do is to really look at the world right now and say, what is happening right now? There's always been war, there's always been natural disasters, there's always been people in leadership roles who were dodgy, that's not new. But what is happening right now, so much of this altogether, things like pandemics, for example. And from a Buddhist perspective, in the spectrum of the big worldview, we talk about the degenerate age as being the time after the Buddha has showed the aspect of passing away. So, it's not like Buddha Shakyamuni was the first Buddha or the last Buddha, right? People are getting enlightened all the time, way before him, after him, all the time. But Shakyamuni Buddha was what we call a supreme Nirmanakaya, which means the beings at that time had the karma to see the Buddha as a Buddha. They could see him for what he was during his lifespan. Whereas we might have met any number of Buddhas in our life and just not known. We didn't have the karma to recognize them. So it was a pivotal time, you know, 2,600 years ago or so, when the Buddha was born in Nepal, India, depending on how you read the maps of those years, and was a real person who really lived a life, was really a prince of a small fiefdom, really gave up his wife and his kingdom, really lived the life of a renunciate. The question of was he already enlightened and showing the aspect of these things, or was he a regular person going through these things? Debatable point, doesn't really matter. But he existed, and during his lifetime, gathered a huge amount of followers and momentum, and even during his living years, so many people got enlightened. Some after only hearing one teaching from him. 
they say that um one of his, like his auntie who raised him she became enlightened almost straight after she got ordained as a nun with her 500 ladies in waiting <laughs> his wife wound up getting realizations very quickly after she started having teachings with him his son became one of his main followers so like everyone with strong karmic connection with him as soon as they heard teachings from him they understood very quickly one of the Buddhist holidays is descent from Tashida. So, of course, his birth mother, Maya, she died giving birth to him, right? And she went up to a pure land. And the Buddha thought, I must repay the kindness of my mother. So he went to Tashida heaven, taught her the spiritual path. She got enlightened. But then people on earth were like, come back, come back. And so he descended from Tashida. He came back and kept teaching. So it's really fascinating to think there was a being and there was a time and there were sentient beings in such a way everything came together. Everything came together. It was a renaissance. And then as soon as the Buddha passes, there is a time of degeneration of merit. It doesn't mean it's forever, right? And, you know, anyone who studied history at all knows this is the way it goes. Dark ages, renaissance, dark ages, renaissance, dark ages, renaissance, the pendulum swings. In every direction of the pendulum swing, there are beings who are able to use what is happening as the path to awakening. And it's said that during a time like this, where merit is degenerating, where there's no obvious Buddha or no merit to see a Buddha in their full-fledged form, that actually doing virtue is stronger because we have fewer supports. Like think of how hard it is to just sit and focus. How hard it is to learn and train yourself to do anything new that's positive. You know, it might for, especially for younger people, it's very easy for them to learn a new video game and to get really good at it because their attachment sucks their concentration right? And the attachment and concentration just get merged together, and they learn this new thing really, really quickly. But for those of us who don't have the interest in that game, it would take us ages to learn it because we don't have anything to fuel it. Yeah, but you see how easy it is to learn new things that are non-virtuous or neutral, but it's really hard to learn new things that are positive. It's a time of degeneration. It's to be expected. But that very hardness means that the merit is more. And so if we can have some sort of practice of rejoicing when we do something as simple as have patience with your grumpy neighbor, you know, who like dumps his rubbish on your side of the fence or forgets to pull his bins in or uses the leaf blower or something obnoxious, you know, like just a moment of I could give in to anger, I could give in to divisiveness. And I'm choosing not to for once, at least today. It's like heroic because it's so hard. It really, it can be so hard. And maybe things like that aren't your issues, but we all have those places where it would be so easy to give in to the habits of negative states of mind. So a time of degeneration is the perfect time for Lojong. It's the perfect time for this genre of teachings because it's saying, let's look at the hardships with the gaze of welcome. And every hardship in your life, if you view it as, this is exactly what I need, this is exactly what I need to transform my mind, it becomes very empowering. Then you don't feel like a victim of circumstance. You don't feel, you know, subject to the whims of society. You think, this is exactly what I needed. I needed this politician. I needed this home maintenance issue. I needed this tragedy. I needed this illness. This is exactly what I needed. So to, to do this in a way that doesn't fall into the trap of spiritual bypassing, you have to first acknowledge, I didn't want it, though. I don't like this, though. You have to be real for a few beats. You have to sit with, I didn't want that to happen with my health. I didn't want that to happen. And be real with yourself and experience the grief or the shock or the anger at that. And then say, and this is exactly what I need for my practice. So if you jump over the step 
of acknowledging your resistance or acknowledging your pain, then it won't work. It won't be fuel unless you really are real with yourself. It's like making compost into beautiful fertilizer for the garden and thinking, oh, this is great compost. You're not pretending that it doesn't also stink. Yes? <laughs> You're just thinking this compost is going to be some good compost. Yeah? Smell it. It's awful. It's awful. This is going to be great. Yeah? This is the way we're trying to see our hardships in life. That is awful. And it's great. Yeah? That. So Lojong is all about that. Okay. So <laughs> the significance of this instruction, this Lojong instruction, it's like a diamond, the sun, and a medicinal tree. These are just analogies for very important, powerful things that are valuable to us. Because in this time of five degenerations, we will transform them into the fully awakened state. So then we have the beginning, the actual instructions for guiding the disciples is given in seven points, explaining the preliminaries as the basis for the practice. So first train in the preliminaries. This involves contemplating the significance and rarity of a life as a free and fortunate human being, contemplating impermanence and death, thinking about causes and results of actions, and thinking about the vicious nature of cyclic existence. Okay, <laughs> so you're like, oh, great, that sounds fun. Um, so how about we do it, shall we? Let's first train in the preliminaries. Let's do the meditation that goes with this. All right, so we'll just do a short meditation. Get yourself a nice posture, straight back. And really sit in such a way where you feel strong and supported without tension. So as Roshi Joan Halifax would say, strong back, soft front. And just be a compassionate witness to your own physical experience. Let yourself be in that first step of just acknowledging the body for all of its aches and pains and annoyances, such a good vehicle, such a good vehicle, this human body. From a worldly perspective, might not seem perfect at all, but from a spiritual path perspective, completely perfect. This is all that I need, this body and this mind. So just revive that motivation from the beginning, thinking I go for refuge to the Buddha as the doctor, the Dharma as the, as the medicine, the Sangha as the nurses, until I achieve enlightenment. And through the practice of the six perfections, of listening to the teachings, of Lojong, of anything to do with bodhicitta, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Just revive that motivation, speaking it back to yourself. And with that motivation, we do a brief meditation on perfect human rebirth. And so we start with the basic idea that this life, my life, is perfect for the spiritual path. Because I have had enough suffering. I've had enough suffering to be curious about suffering 
to want to understand the causes of suffering and what ends it. But I don't have so much suffering that I'm lost in it. I'm not suffering so greatly as someone in the hell realms or the hungry ghost realms, the animal realms. I'm also not suffering from too much pleasure, like the pleasure of those in the gods and demigods realms, or the pleasure of those billionaires who are so surrounded by affluence that their empathy gets shut off and they don't even notice the pain of those who work for them. And so it's also perfect that we have happiness, but we're not drunk with pleasure. We have enough resources, enough supports, but not so much so that we're shielded or too distant from the pain of others. And so just let your mind sit with how fortunate it is to not have too much suffering or too much pleasure. That we have this human life with a useful mixture of both. Think of your own useful mixture of both. And then expand that and think of how fortunate it is to live where you live. That there's a degree of safety and a degree of freedom. And that safety and freedom means you can pursue whatever you want to pursue. Without fear for your life. And also there is access, access to any information that you want. So just feel the benefit of where you live, imperfect though it may be. You have a safe, warm house. You have a safe, free country. And that is actually quite rare. And so feel really bolstered, really nourished by the awareness of your freedoms and opportunities. And at the same time, now bring in the awareness of impermanence. That all of this could change in an instant. There could be a natural disaster a bushfire burning your house. There could be a war. 
and suddenly your country is seen as a threat. There could be a radical change of government and suddenly access to information is much different and limited. And these things might seem far away. They happen all the time. And this body, which is healthy enough to be independent, to get from point A to point B, has enough strength to attempt meditation and study, could at any point exhaust its life force through accident or illness or age. Healthy people die before sick people every day. Young people die before old people every day. There's no guarantee of where we'll be tomorrow. In our own bed or in our next life. Just let your mind touch the preciousness of this life as well as its fragility. And after death, just as a shadow follows the body, the results of black and white actions follow. Karma is definite. Those positive actions done in this and past lives will result as happiness, resources, support. And those negative, destructive actions done in this and past lives will result as suffering, shortened life, illness, hardships of many types. So may we strengthen the positive and purify and prevent the negative. driven by the sense of urgency that death could come at any time. And dedicate the meditation. Jantu Senjorim Poshe, Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyuchi, Ke Panyam Pame Payam, Gone Gondu Pawasho, Doni Dawarim Poshe, Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyuchi, Ke Panyam Pame Payam. Gone, gone, do pelon show. Okay. So, first train in the preliminaries. <laughs> first train in the preliminaries. They are the basis of practice. So, when we do these, I think it's easy to skip the preliminaries because we're so familiar intellectually. 
and it seems maybe a little bit cringy or a little bit weird to think of the fortunate life that you have. Um, you know, it can kind of, I don't know, just feel a little bit sugary and sweet, or it can feel a little bit, I don't know, like asking for Zeus to strike you down with lightning or something. I don't know. It can trigger all sorts of things to really go through what is good about your life. But if you do what is good about your life from the perspective of both the good of the suffering and the good of the happiness, and then take that and remember it's changeable, remember it's fragile, then it's really going in the right way. And it's creating the right sense of urgency that's not anxiety, urgency without anxiety. Yeah, and that preliminary really can fuel the rest of the practice. So if you're lacking, I guess, oomph and energy in your practice, just sit with the preliminary a little bit, even though intellectually you know so well. Go back to the beginning again and again. Do you have any thoughts so far? Questions or ideas that come up? It's been very moving for me because I think it, it sounds a bit um, sad, but uh, uh, you having been here, I only saw you um, about uh, 2018 or 2019 a couple of times. It's very isolating when you're at a centre without uh, Sangha. Yeah. Um, uh, not saying, not, not being sad about it, but um, sitting listening to you this morning, you just remember it all. You go, yes, I know all that. But uh, people do visit and people are online, but it's very, um, uh, you just keep forgetting it. And then you listen to you this morning, you go, yes, I remember all that. What happened? <laughs> so, um, and then you go, well, I should be able to do that. You know, what do you mean? You've been doing this, in my case, for nearly 40 years. What's your problem? Um, so it's just, it's just, reminds me and yet this morning you go so I know all that but in a funny sort of way where when you don't and you were using the term the sangha that being the nurses if you like if people aren't there you, it's very hard in that isolated sense of not uh, when you don't have sangha there so that's just just that's how nice. I felt about it. so I was a bit emotional about uh, listening to you this morning that's probably a, a, a bit of poor me but yeah, uh, no. and I'm not asking I'm not asking for a solution but it's just um it just brings it back to you about how difficult it is um, in, in a, in a, you know, the community is still here. It's been here for 32 years, ups and downs. We are surviving. Uh, and uh, I think we will continue. But uh, it's hard without um, without Sangha. That's just how I feel. No, absolutely. It's so valid. And, you know, it's it's so easy to take it for granted when things are going well and there's like a routine and a schedule and it's it's the programming is sort of on a roll. Then it's so easy to take it for granted and you think, ah, oh, I won't go this week. Yeah, it'll happen next week. And then, you know, the expectation. I mean, I, I, I was just the same. Right. I, I just thought I'd stay at Chen Rezig Institute sort of infinitely until my teacher died. And I only got like seven years in before he moved to India. And I was just so shaken, you know, because I just had this whole vision of, well, even if I don't remember this point or that point, we'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. And it's just so easy to take what you have for granted. It really is. And, you know, all I can say is, is just keep showing up. Just keep showing up for each other. Just keep showing up for yourself, keep showing up to your cushion. And really it's the repetition is what makes it stick. And, and, you know, I've said it a million times and I have to tell myself a million times, but as soon as you've understood, you begin. It's, and we think as soon as you've understood, you're done. You know, oh, I understand that now, now I'm done. It's like, no, now you can begin. And again, and again, and it's hard for us, especially, you know, deep thinking, compassionate people who are relatively intelligent, you know, we, we get it. And then we don't know why we forget the lessons we already learned. And it really is just repetition. And to remember that, you know, gom in Tibetan meditation means to familiarize, you know, what is meditation, but familiarization again and again, and again. So just don't give up on yourself don't give up on the dharma and really what creates the best conditions to meet the best teachers and the best communities and the best resources is the gathering you know and so i think we got a little bit 
maybe not lazy, but just tired during the pandemic. We got so tired and got so used to being able to do things online. And it's been amazing because it means we can still stay connected to each other, even when, you know, like I'm in the States. But, you know, it means that sometimes even just local things we don't go to in person because we'd rather stay in our jammies. <laughs> And why not? Right? Of course. But, you know, if you can keep showing up for each other. And the community dramas of every single community of humans throughout time and space is the spiritual path. I think that's the important thing to keep remembering. You know, as I go from Dharma Center to Dharma Center, the thing that's the same is that there is a feeling that whatever specific drama of any community is, that it's an obstacle to the, the center flourishing. And it is and it isn't. It's like it's the obstacle and also it's the path. You know, so how do we workshop our own resistances and workshop our own community dynamics? And all of this is so tricky. And at the same time, pacing ourselves and being kind to ourselves and taking time away when we need to and doing things online when we need to and just pacing is everything. Repetition and pacing. <laughs> and if you can get that balance right, you're cooking with gas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, first train in the preliminaries. Keep thinking again and again about the way in which hardships have made an opening to understanding other humans and then when they're happening in real time how easy it is to forget so you think of your past hardships with a halfway fond gaze i'm glad that i made those mistakes or i'm glad that that terrible thing happened in the big picture sense of understanding humanity but then whatever is happening for you right now you think can it just finish <laughs> you know forgetting that hindsight you'll look at it with different eyes and think that was the very thing, the very thing that I needed. So hard. So perfect human rebirth. That's a tricky one, but keep coming back to it. And uh, when we look at these guys, you know, really remembering that the point of all of it is to get ourselves training the awakening mind. I, I like it when Bodhicitta is, um, translated as the awakening mind because the ing is important yes because it's in process right it's in process and to train in the awakening mind you have to really have the sense of gentle incremental change and gentle incremental change can be a delight it can be a real delight but not if you miss the steps happening as they play out you know, so really celebrate the tiny victories, you know, the driving in traffic and somebody cuts you off and a year ago, even you would have shouted at them or made a gesture or just grumbled in your car and been angry for five to 10 minutes, you know, and even a year later, you're like, actually, I just was like, oh, that was surprising anyway. And you moved on, you know, that is a victory that only you know about you and the Buddhas, but like, let yourself feel it that is also important and it's part of the practice of rejoicing which actually maximizes merit so again like rejoicing also cringe you know so cringy right oh yay you know it's like a little yuck but if you can sit with just actually let the profundity touch you it is so hard to think of anything other than your own experience it is so hard to think of anything but your own experience Anytime you're thinking of others and considering others, it's just remarkable, really. Yeah. And to genuinely be thinking of others, not thinking of others in terms of, do they like me? What can I do so that they like me? Or what can I do so that they respect me? No, but genuinely just for them, equalizing and exchanging. Yeah. So seven point mind training goes into, um, right into the hardcore stuff right so the the actual practice training in the awakening mind you got a moment for preliminaries but it's actually only this passage is what they give to the preliminaries then the actual practice they get right into banish the one to blame for everything meditate on the great kindness of all beings practice a combination of giving and taking 
giving and taking should be practiced alternately. You should begin by taking from yourself. These two should be made to ride on the breath. So this is one section. This is all Tonglen, but I'll talk about the first two first, because I think even if you remember just one of these, it could change your life. Banish the one to blame for everything, or meditate on the great kindness of all beings. Either of those, if you held it as a touchstone, what it could do for you. So when they say banish the one to blame for everything, what is the one to blame for everything? What is the one to blame for everything? Yeah, you have many thoughts arise, I'm sure, and they're probably all going the same, the right direction. Probably all going the right direction. The one to blame for everything. We could call them the twin demons, self-cherishing, self-grasping. Yeah. Really, in this context, because we're talking about conventional bodhicitta, we're talking about self-cherishing. The one to blame for everything is self-cherishing. To blame for everything is self-cherishing. That let that resonate. The one to blame for everything. You're like, everything? Yeah, everything. <laughs> everything. You're like, what about, I don't know, the um, the dr the downpipe falling down out there? What about <laughs> the smell of the cat litter? What about the fact that my nose itches? What about my scratchy socks? Everything? Yes, everything. <laughs> it's to blame for everything. But how, though? But how, though? And so first we think, all right, what is self-cherishing? We know what self-cherishing is. We're good Dharma students. However, we have to keep coming back to clarifying the frame. There's positive self-cherishing, which is fine, which is looking after yourself, which is self-care. Good, do that. Negative self-cherishing, what we're talking about here, is self-absorption with indifference to others. And it leads to at the expense of others. But it's that type of self-absorption where you're in tunnel vision. And because of that tunnel vision, you do actions that harm others, which plants negative karmic seeds on your continuum, which ripens the suffering. You know, so your itchy nose is from your self-cherishing. Right? The problems in the environment are reflections of our communal karma. It really is the one to blame for everything. So it's not you, though. You're not bad, right? Your mental continuum has the potential to become enlightened. Your mental continuum is by nature clarity and awareness, uncontaminated, unpolluted, or by the stains, the adventitious stains. Remember that obnoxious word, adventitious, right? Negative states of mind like anger and jealousy and pride and attachment, they arise in our mind, but they are not intrinsic to the nature of mind. They are removable but they come from self-grasping and self-cherishing. So when we look at ultimate bodhicitta later, maybe um, maybe the, in a couple sessions, ultimate bodhicitta is really looking at how to overcome self-grasping ignorance, right? Self-grasping ignorance that doesn't understand how you exist in relation to others. It's what makes the veil. Yeah, it's what makes that grasping at inherent existence and that appearance of inherent existence that we grasp onto. That is such a fascinating part of Buddhist philosophy, that the way things seem, not just visually, but the way things seem through all of our senses is wrong, right? The way they seem is not how they are. They seem to exist in and of themselves just as they are. They seem to kind of spontaneously pop out of nowhere from nothing, even though intellectually we understand causation in the natural world. There's a funniness the way we view life. There's something incorrect about the way we see ourselves and others. And fundamentally, it boils down to an illusion of separateness. Yeah, and if you feel separate, it's only natural to want to build a fence or dig a moat or put up barbed wire energetically, right? If not literally and physically, it makes perfect sense to batten down the hatches and hunker down and cocoon yourself in and to tell everyone to go away because they're the source of your pain 
or to cling and grasp at everyone because they're supposed to make you feel comfortable. If you are alone and separate, then your relation to others becomes one of objectification. They become objects that either give you pleasure or give you pain. You don't see them as human beings that you're interconnected with. This is what happens to us. So because of our self-grasping, we have self-cherishing. So we see this illusory self that seems to inherently exist, and then we must protect it. And what we do to protect it winds up making it worse. And it's to be, uh, I guess it's to be expected that we'll make all these mistakes. We're not to be blamed for making all these mistakes. We're to blame self-cherishing. Yeah, don't blame the self, blame self-cherishing. The relative self is fine. The relative self is fine. That which is merely labeled on the collection of body and mind is fine. Your consciousness, remarkable. Your ignorance, problematic, <laughs> right? So to everyone's, so to everyone's. So banish the one to blame for everything. I mean, it's a fascinating thing to think in the middle of an argument, especially an argument that you're losing. Maybe an argument that you're winning, think either direction. But like, why do I feel this way? Why are they doing that? Why am I reaping this? Why is this happening? It's happening because of the current self-cherishing and the past self-cherishing. My self-cherishing, their self-cherishing. All of it. Banish the one to blame for everything. So this one, you know, it only works if you understand how self-cherishing has ruined your life, right? It only works if you really get how self-cherishing spoils the beauty of life. The way self-cherishing spoils the beauty of relationships. Yeah, it spoils it. It's the same thing that makes you self-conscious and insecure and vain and fragile. Self-cherishing is what does that to us. All of our insecurities, all of our self-loathing, and all of our arrogance and all of our bravado, it's all coming from not understanding how the self exists and then trying to protect that illusory self. Does it make sense? So if you think banish the one to blame for everything, what it does is put a little chink in the armor that self-cherishing creates. And when there's that chink in the armor, the light can come through, right? Think Leonard Cohen. I don't know. That's how the light gets through. But you're making the chink by thinking, yeah, banish the one to blame for everything. Yeah, you're making that dent. The armor felt like protection, but the armor was actually separating you even worse than before. So if you can sort of play with what's the experiential quality of self-cherishing when it's particularly aggressive, then it's easier to catch it when it's in its smaller, more insidious forms. So self-cherishing when it's really, really up, these the, the sort of examples of your life that point to it are going to be individual to you, but you can think in terms of kind of universal experiences of when you get too specific about your needs. Yeah, you have a normal human need, but self-cherishing makes it too specific. Yeah. For example, food is the easiest, right? You're hungry, you want healthy food, you would like vegetables to be involved, some sort of protein, some sort of grain, in a combination that digests okay. That is a reasonable need. Yes, reasonable, no worries. Self-cherishing says it has to be specifically these ingredients at this temperature, at this time, with this plating, with the server having this demeanor, and they need to talk to me in this way. And if all of that doesn't happen, something is wrong. And I'm sending the food back, <laughs> right? That tightness, it's that tightness and that tension that can't allow flexibility. You know, when you've like landed on a conclusion or a decision about something with a lot of self-cherishing, it becomes almost impossible for you to change your mind. Yeah, because it feels like you're giving in or it feels like you're losing face or you start to feel a slip of dignity because your ego is all tied up with the decision. And the decision made under the influence of self-cherishing is just from such a fragile mind. You could make the same exact decision from a place of wisdom, 
And then if it's challenged with new information, you go, oh, I didn't know that. Cool. All right, I'll shift. And it's flexible and it's easy and it's spacious. And it can even be creative and playful to change your mind. But when the decision or the opinion has been made under the influence of self-cherishing, a challenge to it becomes a challenge to self, and now you must defend. You don't even have space to consider you might be wrong. Do you know this? And I'm sure you see it in your friends and your family, but the important thing is to see it in yourself. Yeah, when do you really lock down and double down on your decision or double down on your opinion? Yeah, because self-cherishing was involved. So it's not about the contents, it's about the attitude you brought to it. So don't get lost in the details or the examples. Really think about what is this attitude that tightens? What is this attitude that makes me fragile or harden? Yeah, what is that? That is self-cherishing. What happens to me when self-cherishing is up in terms of my speech, in terms of my physicality, in terms of my mood? How can I find it? How can I know it? And, you know, it, it's, it could be something as simple as the last big argument you had with someone, the way the things you thought when you were angry felt absolutely vital, mandated, definite. And then you chilled out and you settled down and you went for a walk and you had a good night's sleep and you thought about that same stuff and you thought, oh, maybe I exaggerated a little or maybe it wasn't that bad or actually those things were just as I saw them to be, but not as important as I made them. The observation was accurate, but the emotion was excessive, et cetera, right? You know how you feel when you've settled down after a fight and retrospectively look at your own train of thought. That can really help you catch it better the next time. So banish the one to blame for everything, that one. If that one's not nailing it for you, the other one is in a way gentler, but also very, very challenging. Meditate on the great kindness of all beings. Meditate on the great kindness of all beings. Are all beings kind? <laughs> you go, no, <laughs> no, they're not. And yet, what is kindness? If you really think about it, okay, what is kindness? It's when you have been benefited, right? When you have been benefited, when you have been supported, when you've been facilitated in your growth process. Okay, if you're framing kindness that way, then you know that your enemies and your harmers were kind, but you don't want to give them credit because they were awful and they didn't mean to help you. They might have even meant to hurt you. Or it was just kind of a passive thing and they were causing chaos just because of carelessness. But they didn't mean to be kind. They were actually neutral or negative. But if you're thinking of every single sentient being as kind in the sense that there's a chance for learning if you take on that challenge. It's, it's the difference between thinking that everything is a blessing and everything is a teaching bestowed upon you from a higher power involuntarily or from your side deciding I can make something a teaching if I want it to be I can decide and maybe the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are orchestrating conditions to try and get me to wake up or maybe sentient beings are just full of chaos and crazy or maybe it's both but I get to decide I can make anything a teaching and the way to make things a teaching is usually through interaction. Seems like positive interaction would be the easiest way to transform, but in a way it can make you complacent. What if every rude person was like a mindfulness bell waking you up? How kind. How kind they are to be so rude. How kind they are to be so obnoxious. Yeah, how kind they are to leave the trolley out in the parking lot where someone can hit it. How kind. <laughs> yeah, because it gives you this opportunity to look at yourself and your judgmentalness and your lack of real love, yeah, or at least unbiased love, to look at your lack of equanimity. It's a chance. But it can be quite empowering to think of it in terms of, I get to decide. It can be a teaching if I want it to be. 
I can see it as kindness if I want to. Yeah, it's my mind. It's my life. Yeah, and what's going to actually help my development for the greater good is to train in that way. You know, there's a saying that my old Zen teacher used to say when I was a teenager, he used to say, see, see everyone as your teacher. And I remember at the time going, but they're not, though. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but they're not. And he would say, yeah, but what if they were? But what if they were? What would they be trying to say? What if you watched every interaction through that lens of this, this can be a teaching if I let it? Yeah, this can be a teaching if I let it. So meditate on the great kindness of all beings. Meditate on the great kindness of all beings. Meditate on the great kindness of all beings. And then literally you can look at their kindness. Yeah, their literal kindness, kindness, on purpose kindness, their acts of generosity, their acts of love, their acts of compassion. Absolutely, look at that. Absolutely can nourish you. But don't forget, the problematic ones might have been the ones that were the most kind in terms of your growth. All of which you know. Yeah, you already knew that. But again, 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 right? And so thinking in your life right now, Think about who in your life right now is acting in a way you wish they weren't, <laughs> right? I'm sure everyone's got one, right? You've got probably more than one, okay? Relative, friend, coworker, neighbor, someone who is just, you may like them generally or not like them generally, but right now they're behaving in a way that is really disagreeable to you. What happens if you think, what kindness? What's your reaction? Does it like, like calm you? Does it open you? Does it make you roll your eyes? <laughs> what does it do? You think, how kind. You can think of a politician. Not naming any names, you can name a politician. How kind you are to do that horrible thing. How kind you are to make that terrible policy. How kind you are. It shows me the result of greed. It shows me the result of anger and egocentrism. It shows me what arrogance leads to. It shows me what unchecked power leads to. Thank you. That was very kind of you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? Like, how do you make it the lesson? You have to be a little creative, but... It's useful, you know, but in terms of someone in your direct life right now, to really name the behavior you do not want to be there, name it. You're doing this. And they are doing this from a relative's perspective. And that is kind. It's an interesting framing. It's an interesting framing. Yeah, what, what do you guys think? What thoughts are arising with that one? I think... The word kindness is, you know, I associate kindness with a certain action, of course. But if I would substitute, for example, yes, just to get used to it, that word kindness with opportunity, then I get the whole thing. Yeah. You know, if I if I look at it, like you said, for example, with a trolley, I can say, oh, what idiot put the trolley on the other side? I can say, that's an opportunity for me to take the trolley, put it back myself without any judgment. So that makes it easier for me as I... Personally, kindness is always something sweet and nice. And, you know, it's a difficult thing to get my head around. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think it's part of why these, these Lojong trainings are so pointed and provocative. Because oh. you don't want to say it's kindness because your little, you know, your, your mind goes, it's not though. <laughs> it's not kind they, yeah. because they didn't intend to benefit. Yeah. But if you're thinking it does benefit it it also costs your pride something that's what's insidious about self cherishing is that somehow we don't want to give anyone credit for our growth mm -hmm. except for maybe a select few who are really special and elevated or very close and dear mm -hmm. we can give them credit for supporting our growth mm -hmm. but our pride does not like the idea of giving credit to some careless jerk who left their trolley in the handicap zone you know, we, we don't want to give him any credit for our growth. We think he's a jerk. Yeah. And, you know, that's what's so interesting is play with that. 
play with that like that place of resistance of I don't want to <laughs> mm. right? yeah because it's not an accident that that word is used mm. yeah and, but you're quite right the gateway to getting there is to think of it as an opportunity 100 that's the gateway to get there but try and get all the way there too. With the kindness. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Other other thoughts, you guys. Wonderful to see you too, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Other thoughts. Is that who is that behind Lois? I can't tell. I can't tell. We have yeah. Laurel and Fiona. Laurel and Fiona, nice to see you guys as well. Nice yeah, I'm Anne. I don't think you're oh, like Anne. <laughs> Nice to see you all. Yeah, experiment with it. But, you know, it, because this is going to be a once a week, just four part series, I think it's really useful to pick one and play with it for the week. You don't have to take it on board if it doesn't wind up resonating, but just play with it for a week. So pick, either banish the one to blame for everything or meditate on the great kindness of all beings. Pick one and just see what happens if you weave it in to your daily life. Yeah, even if you just launch the day with it and it's like something you repeat to yourself while you're brushing your teeth or it's something you repeat to yourself while you're tying your shoes. But this is the way to like get them into your system. And then you kind of can start getting more creative with understanding the different ways they can land hmm. yeah any any other thoughts um i am just deeply grateful for this morning because you've clarified so much that i big as fairly new to the study i found the old language the medieval language a bit hard to understand and apply so that you've been able to put it into everyday modern context and it's it's wonderful. Now I feel like I've got so many things I can actually practice day to day. And some of them I do already, like driving in traffic and and having road rage and all that stuff. But um, actually the, the great kindness is, um, and I'm very grateful, Monique, for the opportunity word too, because that's something that I can do a lot more. So thank you so much. I'm so grateful. And thank you, everybody at Kunsan Yeshe as mm. well for being there. That's that's our sanger. So yeah. yeah. Thank you, darling. Yeah, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. And I hope I can see you guys. I do have plans to visit New South Wales, hopefully in 2025, fingers crossed. So hopefully I can see you guys at some point soon. Yeah. Yeah, I really miss you guys. Lovely. Thank you. So yeah. the the last part of this one, I thought we would do just a short reflection. Um, practice the combination of giving and taking. This is Tonglen. Giving and taking should be practiced alternately. You should begin by taking from yourself. These two should be made to ride on the breath. So this one we'll just introduce and then we'll do it as a longer meditation next week. But when we do Tonglen and we do it in the tradition of Geshe Chakawa, starting with ourselves is kind of weird but actually it becomes really interesting because we're used to tonglen giving and taking as being about our relationship to the suffering of other people and how do we manage the suffering of other people and how do we manage our resistance to it and how do we offer loving kindness and compassion to other people all of which is vital but what happens if you start with yourself so you are a whole sentient being that deserves happiness and freedom from suffering. And you're like, yes, 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 I know. But if you give it some airtime and you really let yourself think of what is happening right now that I do not want physically, mentally, financially, relationally, situationally, what is happening right now that I do not want? And you name it for yourself. And then you imagine. I'm taking it on voluntarily and I'm giving it to the self-cherishing thought. My pain of it, my resistance to it came from the self-cherishing thought. I'll give it back to the self-cherishing thought. This is the thought. And so it's, it's not about self-blame or self-punishment. It's not about forcing yourself to do anything. 
It's about deciding to make a hardship voluntary, and that will make you stronger. Just the way when you decide to exercise, you know that the resistance or the discomfort you feel actually will lead to you getting stronger. Yeah. And just like exercise, you do enough that you're touching a bit of discomfort, but you're not pushing to pain. So you might not start with your biggest hardships. You might start with, I don't know, the heater in the living room isn't as powerful as the heater in the bedroom, and that's annoying. <laughs> you know, start with something kind of like low stakes. Start with, uh, I've got a weird, I don't know, I've got a weird tension in my lower back, and it just tweaks when I move a certain way. That's annoying. It's not a big deal. It's low stakes. Yeah. Pick a few small things and think the pain of it and the resistance to it came from the self-cherishing thought. Give it back to the self-cherishing thought. Yeah. And then you switch and you think happiness, well-being, resources, that actually came from sentient beings. Because of interacting with them, I created positive karma. The positive karma was planted on my mental continuum. And probably because of other interactions, that was the condition to sprinkle it and germinate it and make it ripen as happiness. So what if I was to think my happiness came from sentient beings? Give it back to sentient beings. Yeah, self-cherishing came. Suffering came from the self-cherishing thought. Give it back to the self-cherishing thought. Happiness came from sentient beings. Give it back to sentient beings. And you practice these alternately, the two riding on the breath. So the simplest way to do Tonglen, and we'll do more advanced ways next week, but the simplest way is to think on the in-breath, compassion, on the out-breath, love. In-breath, may all sentient beings be free of suffering. Out-breath, may all sentient beings have happiness. So whether you're thinking just the word compassion and the word love, or you're thinking of the definitions of those two, or just the feeling of those two, in-breath, you're taking on suffering, connecting with compassion. Out-breath, giving happiness, connecting with love, like that. And if you feel ready to weave in a visualization, you can, but let's just do the simplest form for a few minutes right now, and we'll start with ourselves. Okay, <clears throat> so back to a good posture. And so before we even focus on the breath, just thinking about the negative things in our life that are difficult, things we wish weren't the case. Thinking physically, thinking mentally, just a couple of things that we have resistance to. And think this discomfort is the result of actions born from self-cherishing. And self-cherishing is like a shell covering my heart, my good kind heart that wishes the best for everyone. This shell of self-cherishing feels like protection feels like armor, but it's actually a giant wall separating me from others. It can even block the feeling of being loved and accepted by all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, by all the everyday people who love us. The wall of self-cherishing makes us feel isolated and misunderstood. And so imagine that these hardships in your life become the very thing that weakens self-cherishing. They came from self-cherishing. Give them back to self-cherishing. So just focusing only on the in-breath for a few breaths. 
imagine you take these hardships on, on purpose, and you give them to that hard shell around your heart. And that very poison of the suffering in your life becomes very useful to dissolve that shell. And so breathing in the polluted poison of these sufferings, give it to the self-cherishing thought. Just the in-breath. Every in-breath, taking back on your own suffering, giving it to self-cherishing and weakening it. more and more cracks form in that shell covering your good heart. And as that shell dissolves more and more, imagine loving kindness in the form of golden light is released and fills your whole body. Imagine that this light gives you access to your own happiness, to your own positive karmic seeds. And as you're filled up with light, you remember all of this happiness came through interaction with sentient beings. So offer it to them. And so switch to focusing on the out-breath, sending out golden light on the out-breath, happiness, resources, love. Happiness came from sentient beings, give it back to sentient beings. But in so doing, you are not emptied out. Your heart becomes like a wellspring that never dries up. Filled with light, sending out light. Your good heart free of its cage. And now simplify all of these ideas to just compassion on the in-breath, love on the out-breath. Compassion in, love out. For all sentient beings, including yourself. May all sentient beings be free of suffering. May all sentient beings have happiness. Again and again.
and relax those thoughts and just stay with the sense of your good, kind heart. And with it is a new awareness of that shell that wants to creep back in, that wants to cover it. And in acknowledging that it wants to arise, you're more likely to prevent it. And imagine you see your own self-cherishing habits and recognize them better now. You self-cherishing felt like protection, but you were actually a prison. May we have the courage to keep our heart open. We dedicate Janju Sancho Rimpo She Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyuchi Ke Panam Pa Me Pa Yong Gone Gondu Pawa Sho. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. Well, I'll see you next week, and it was wonderful to see you all. Happy practicing. Thank you, Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you, honey. Thank, Thank you, Vanny Molly Alton. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye, all. <laughs> Now, um, I just want to show you how many cool resources there are for this text. Start Where You Are by Be Venerable Pema Chodron is actually on this text. And it's really good for those of you that are not familiar with Buddhist terminology. Then the one by B. Allen Wallace is great for those who enjoy a technical presentation. And then Mind Training Like the Rays of the Sun is the one that I started with, and it has a nice Lam Rim outline way of framing it together with the commentary by Num Capel. Now these, the two on the ends are newer. These are contemporary compilations of lots of Lojong texts. So I really recommend those two if you're interested. But for just a classic Geshe style presentation, we have the one by Geshe Sonam Rinchen there in the middle. But wait, there's more. So the ones you guys have um, included in your course materials is The Kindness of Others by Geshe Jampa Techok. And it's brilliant. It's really experiential as well as technical when it needs to be. And Similar to that one are the ones by Gomo Chuku and Chogim Trumpa.